don't know what in the world all you people are doing here. <laughs> but it scares the bejeebers out of me. After uh, 40, more, 40 or more years of lecturing, I still get nervous before a lecture, and this is the worst kind of lecture. Anyway, I wish to thank you for coming. And you all have read this strange title, and I've had some wonderful comments on it. And I promise you it's going to be all those things, self-indulgent, idiosyncratic, anecdotal, chaotic, and da-da-da-da-da. Uh, and we're going to try to touch on, on uh, three or four different topics today. A bit of microanatomy, uh, oxygen supply to muscle, and cardiac muscle thermodynamics. And I intend to tell you with each slide where it is that I think I am, which might help you to see where you think you are in this talk. And I want to spread the blame for this. And the blame resides with uh, J.C. Han, sitting here, who invited me to speak and my foolishness to accept. Uh, and, uh, and with uh, Kenneth, who's hiding somewhere at the back, who suggested this topic, which I instantly said, this will be of no interest and no one will come. <laughs> uh, but I'd like you to note before we start that the words chaotic and chaotic come from different roots. Let's start with uh, two themes microanatomy and oxygen supply. And what you're seeing there is a, an electron micrograph of a transverse section of a rat um, papillary muscle of small diameter. The uh, black sausage looking things are mitochondria and the other stippled area it, uh, we attribute to uh, crossbridge to, um, to uh, uh, contractile proteins. This was a pretty well constructed, designed study, in my opinion. Uh, we can see the difference in area there is about eightfold between the biggest cross sectional area and the smallest. But there was no difference whatsoever in the contractile content or the mitochondrial content. So when we uh, plot the maximal force as a function of the cross-sectional area, um, we see that, not surprisingly, um, big muscles produce more force than small muscles. But if we now rescale that to stress, that is, force per cross-sectional area, uh, which is what really matters as far as the heart's concerned, then we see the opposite effect. And we see that big muscles are greatly compromised in uh, developing force. <clears throat> well, that's surely no surprise. We've taken these muscles out of the heart, uh, and we've therefore isolated them from blood supply and an oxygen supply. And the obvious uh, interpretation of this is that uh, there's oxygen diffusion limitation in these big muscles. Uh, this work was performed by Lee Delbridge. Uh, under my supervision, uh, she did her honor student with, honors uh, thesis with me uh, way back in 1981 in Colin Gibbs' lab. A number of you will already know uh, Lee Delbridge. She's a, a continual visitor to this, uh, these shores. And in fact, uh, Kim Mellor, who's sitting over here, uh, was uh, her most recent PhD student. And given that lineage, I think that makes me something of an academic grandfather, <laughs> whether you like it or not. <laughs> <clears throat> now we're going to take a leap forward on the same topic, but 30 years in 30 years catch up here. And the first of a number of slides by J.C. Han. And these are now uh, not papillary muscles, but trabeculae, uh, which are at least an order of magnitude smaller. And we're pl plotting here active stress as a function of radius. And you'll see it doesn't matter whether we're at uh, 20 room temperature or body temperature or low calcium or high calcium or 
low frequency or high frequency right up to 10 hertz here, there's always the same kind of behavior. So is Greg here? Where's Greg? Oh, thanks. Okay. Uh, Greg is lurking over here. Uh, <clears throat> this is more honors work done by Soyeon Gu in the Department of Physiology under the joint supervision of Ian LeGrace and I. But the pretty pictures are entirely due to, um, to um, Greg's experience with confocal microscopy. So here's a lovely picture that we've all used over and over again, thanks to uh, Soyeon and Greg. And these are a couple of ideal trabeculae in the right ventricle. Notice the scale here of a millimeter. These guys are about 50 micrometers in diameter. In cross-section, you can see all kinds of fascinating things. And what really catches the eye that is looking for such things is the fact that there seems to be a capillary at the corner of every uh, cell in there, so there's a pretty rich supply of blood and we imagine consequently oxygen. Except that doesn't always hold here where Greg has partialed out the, the uh, capillaries and these bigger vessels that we can see here, a couple of them. Uh, you'll see that there's a region down here which doesn't have any capillaries in it. Uh, and that strikes me as being very, very odd because we're in the right ventricle. And as you know, the partial pressure of oxygen in the right ventricle is already low. Uh, so how is diffusion going to be enhanced by the absence of uh, uh, capillaries here? Uh, the oxygen has simply got to come in from the, from the outside. And this next slide doesn't help us any, but it's just so pretty I have to show it to you. <laughs> Uh, and this is um, 275 uh, micrometers, uh, however many slices that is, and we're looking, we're looking into the blood supply of this uh, particular um, cross-section of, uh, well, it's, it's heaps of cross-sections here, uh, all stacked up. And once again, we see <coughs> proof that there's a patch in this muscle which has very poor oxygen and blood supply from its capillary network and must be getting blood from outside in the ventricle as well. <clears throat> we have no idea whether these are supply vessels or return vessels, that is arterioles or venules, uh, but we're taken by this funny little quirk in the, uh, in the um, capillaries here uh, where we do a loop-the-loop. Uh, once again, thank you, Greg, for your input into that. <clears throat> and now to bring you absolutely right up to date with uh, work proffered by uh, Kevin Choi. Uh, work just where's Kevin sitting? Way in the background there. You shouldn't be. You should be front and center because this is a truly stunning result. Uh, so working again with uh, rat vi right ventricular capillaries. Uh, as a function of cross-sectional area and uh, peak twitch force. And by now you should be familiar with this cascade down here. <coughs> it's the black crosses and we see, yes, the black crosses run down here as usual. Uh, or we can uh, bump up the net force production We're using a barium contracture, barium substituting for calcium. Uh, and the same thing happens. Uh, but now, the coup de, the, uh, coup de gras, these uh, trabeculae are permeabilized. Uh, that is, they have been doused in, uh, in, a, uh, in a soap that dissolves the membranes away. And we can now uh, immediately, we do away with the membrane, and uh, uh, we have access, the inner, whatever we put in the, bath now has immediate access to inside where the contractile proteins are. Uh, and in particular, ATP, the uh, agent that is going to cause cross or permit cross-bridge cycling, uh, is free to go into those cells and they let it equilibrate for a good long while. And now you do this uh, permeabilized, uh, permeabilized uh, cell, permeabilized muscle, um, contracture. 
So now we just increase the, L the ATP concentration, have a look at this thing, and blow me down, it's exactly the same. So it seems to me that kills any limitation from oxygen supply. Uh, and uh, I can't help but wonder if big muscles know their big muscles and flatly refuse to produce the force of young muscles. Anybody can come up with a weirder explanation than that. Uh, I'm wi willing to listen to it. Uh, this to me is absolutely baffling. And once again, I recommend you guys get this into print as soon as possible with an explanation that even I can understand. But I've gotten way ahead of myself. Uh, let's back up a 30 or 40 years. In 1996, Paul Nielsen, who is over there somewhere, I think, uh, Paul, <laughs> hiding. Uh, Paul Nelson and I received a Marsden grant. Uh, and whereas we certainly didn't achieve everything we'd hoped for, uh, Peter, you're not too late. We're just getting down to the interesting <laughs> stuff. Uh, I'm sure one of these young fellows here will stand for you. In fact, the whole row should stand. Oh, no, okay. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't achieve everything we hoped for, but we did have a major coup with Peter's help. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we induced a young PhD graduate in physics from Waikato University uh, to give up his love of speakers, turntables, and robotics and come along with us to become a bioengineer. And that was Andrew Tabiner and Dar Andrew. I had my doubts at the time, but it turned out to be <laughs> the, uh, <coughs> And at the end of uh, that three-year stint, uh, Andrew translocated to, uh, to MIT. Where, you, where he was there for six or seven years. We finally got him back on a repatriation uh, scholarship, fellowship, and he had in his luggage a prototype uh, microcalorimeter, what we had hoped to produce, uh, Paul and I had hoped to produce a good uh, number of years earlier. And just to complete this, uh, in 2006, Nick Smith and I were awarded a Marsden grant. Nick Smith is currently the uh, dean of the Faculty of Engineering. I have rubbed shoulders with some big names uh, <laughs> over the years. And uh, finally, uh, in 2011, uh, Andrew received a Marsden grant to build a cardiac myometer. There is nothing else like it on the planet, to my knowledge. And now I'm going to have to toughen up here, and so are you, and stay awake if you possibly can, because I'm going to rush over very quickly. Bruce, you said you couldn't make it. <laughs> this is a real delight. <laughs> uh, the middle two laws of thermodynamics as applied to muscle. And the first law says that the decrement in enthalpy that goes on before and after a muscle contracts, uh, will turn up as either work or heat. Uh, the H here stands for enthalpy, and uh, enthalpy is just simply energy at constant pressure. And since our muscles perform at constant pressure, uh, we have to take that into account. <coughs> what we do is to calculate quite routinely the mechanical efficiency that is the ratio of the work to the enthalpy, or if you like, the work to the heat plus work. That's pretty straightforward. The other side of this is not quite so straightforward because the second law tells us that not all of the enthalpy uh, is available to perform work. Only that component of it, which is labeled the Gibbs free energy, uh, is the rest of it is uh, this entropic term, the, the product of the change in entropy of the system and the absolute temperature. <clears throat> and if you want to scan all of this and learn it, that would be great. Uh, but the important thing is here, what we would like to always be measuring is the thermodynamic efficiency, which is distinct from the epsilon here and is denoted by um, a Greek symbol whose name is just gone. Uh, thank you, JC, for your help. Uh, eta. eta. 
so this is where we spend our lives in the lab, uh, almost exclusively on this side of the fence. <clears throat> and now to get down to brass tacks with the device that uh, Andrew arrived with in his suitcase, uh, how he managed to convince uh, the safety people and, uh, and immigration that there was no harm in this thing, I don't know, but he's a pretty smooth talker when he needs to be. Here it is, it's, a very, it's very simple in principle. Inside here is a, uh, a trabecula. Uh, on uh, either end of it, roughly, are a pair of uh, thermocouples or more. There can be, uh, they, they can be on both sides and underneath and everywhere else. But the fact is that when a, uh, a perfusate, some solution, is introduced here to flow downstream, then the downstream thermopile will record a higher temperature than the upstream thermopile. And from the flow rate and that difference in temperature, we can calculate the rate at which heat is being produced. Uh, the trabecula uh, is effectively, well, it's, it's uh, connected in here at either end to little, uh, tiny little hooks. And um, inside the outer glass chamber is a an inner glass uh, arm, uh, which, it's, which is connected to a very stiff uh, force transducer. So when we stimulate this uh, trabecula, it will uh, contract and flex this, this um, stiff arm. And I think that's about all we need to know on that one. Um, to my everlasting regret, I uh, I asked Andrew if he would play second fiddle on this paper to J.C. Hahn on the basis that uh, we always like to see a, a student here per, be a first author on at least three different um, manuscripts before they get their Ph.D. Um, how the hell was I to know J.C. was going to produce eight first authored uh, publications during the tenure of his Ph.D.? Anyway, this was published in uh, this was uh, published and completed in uh, 2009, and uh, that didn't satisfy, uh, as we will see in a moment. But it produced isometric contractions, or fixed end contractions, because the hooks uh, held this in place when stimulated at either 0.2 hertz or 2 hertz. Uh, we would get a series of isometric contractions, the height of which gives us a measure of the force and the cross-sectional area of the stress, as we've seen. This was done in what we call high calcium, and uh, the, the, uh, this is the familiar plot now of uh, something plotted against uh, maximal stress, <coughs> and now this is heat. Um, uh, muscle heat, and the stress here has been varied by varying the length of the muscle, which it is uh, rather simple to do in here. And the the results from this first microcalorimeter were so accurate that we could separate these two lines. Not unexpectedly, in higher calcium, it uh, costs a little bit more to activate the muscle. You have to pump more calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum after the contraction uh, so that there's a, uh, an upward displacement here. <coughs> Two years later, uh, we gave Andrew his dues, and he became first author on this <coughs> next model. Uh, which contains the same basic uh, ingredients for measuring heat, uh, except now that the force that is being produced upon stimulation is uh, being measured by a laser. Uh, so there's a, we can make these force, the, the bending of the bar, uh, make that measurement very, very accurately. And at the same time, a new linear motor has been added uh, at the other end of the bar, and the movement of that under software control is being monitored by the second arm of a heterodyne laser. 
So we can now perform genuine bona fide work loops, just as is done with every beat of the heart. So we'll start at this optimal muscle length. That's the highest force that the muscle can produce uh, <clears throat> uh, in response to electrical stimulation. And we'll let the muscle contract isometrically, just as the heart contracts isovolumetrically until it reaches the afterload and the aortic valve opens and the, and the ventricle empties as far as it's going to empty and then relaxes again. So each one of these is a work loop. The work is given by the integral of this uh, uh, roughly square shape here. Uh, an intriguing thing is that <coughs> the this stiff attachment to the, the for, uh, as the force transducer actually is bent, flexed by the muscle when it contracts isometrically, and we get a not a vertical line here, but a line that's tilted, and that's a sign of the accuracy with which the measurement is being made as I see it, and that can be corrected for, that is, this can be straightened up again by pulling the muscle out ever so slightly as it is contracting inward, and that is, it is a pure, genuine, isometric contraction now, and not just fixed at the ends as in the uh, previous calorimeter. Now we're going to change topic slightly. <clears throat> by, the by the time that all that was done, uh, Professor Hiroyuki Suga, uh, his phenomenological pressure volume area theory, or PVA, had become well entrenched in the, both the scientific literature and the clinical literature. Cheers. <laughs> hell you put in that, JC? That's really so good. good. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, I'm going to try to crash through this quite quickly, uh, but it's not straightforward sailing. So this is Suga's pressure volume area or force length area. Remember, if we're dealing with the whole heart, it's pressure, and if it's isolated trabecular or something, it's just force. And Suga says you can do one of these contractions uh, in the whole heart. He had a marvelous setup. It was a cross-perfused, uh, blood-circulated donor heart of, uh, for a dog. So two dogs gave up their lives. One kept its heart beating, the other one kept its heart over here beating, and they could fiddle with this one all they wanted. And it was being blood-supplied the whole time. If you do an isovolumetric contraction here, or an isometric contraction in our case, you come up to here. If you do instead an afterloaded contraction of this sort, uh, you measure the work done. What Suga said, and what utterly baffled us, is that this region down here, which we labeled U for unknown, should be added onto whatever work is done, right up to including the entire triangle, uh, and that gives us force length area. And this was based on the phenomenological observation that if you plot the enthalpy of force length area uh, um, uh, as a function of the force length area, as you vary the shapes of these two here, you get a straight line. There's something really seductive in our brains about straight lines. And this uh, fooled everybody for a long time. <coughs> and the slope of this line, the inverse of the slope, gives us the enthalpy of the force length uh, area. Got that? Yeah, it's pretty easy, isn't it? Uh, JC was, took on the task of replicating, replicating this work here, uh, but using uh, Andrew's rig, <clears throat> and once again describing a whole bunch of afterloaded force length relations, uh, and um, from which, at the same time, by measuring the heat, 
uh, we could calculate the work, that is the area inside any one of these pseudo square areas, rectangular areas, uh, and the uh, ratio of the heat, at, at the sum of the uh, work and the heat, as we've seen, gives us the total enthalpy. And the efficiency we have learned is just the work divided by the enthalpy. And here we see that, and we put the subscript Gibbs on here because Gibbs had made comparable measurements a good 20 years earlier using flatbed, flatbed uh, thermopiles. And we see that at an isometric contraction, there's no work being done, so the efficiency must be zero. Uh, but somewhere along here, as we reduce the afterload, the efficiency is going to peak, in this case at about 12%, before it dives down again, because when you're doing, uh, not lifting any load, you're essentially not doing any work. So the uh, enthalpy is zero, the uh, efficiency is zero. Uh, the efficiency here peaks at about 40% uh, of m maximum uh, relative force or stress. Uh, but what does uh, Sugis do? Well, Sugis can find to this straight line the inverse of which, uh, of the slope of which, is set at 40%. Uh, it seems pretty hard to believe that the heart can ever contract under 40% efficiency when, uh, as we are showing now, as Gibbs did some years ago, it peaks at about 9 or 10 or 12% efficiency. Um, we, we published this uh, under the title of Comparison of Gibbs with Suka's Formulation, and I love this one here, and I'm taking full credit for it. Just a little tag on at the end the demise of iso-efficiency. We were quite sure this would take the world by storm and people would say, uh, Suga might as well give up. Not so, it sank like a bloody stone. And to show you just how far it has sunk out of uh, anybody's ken, uh, here is a, an editorial <coughs> from one of the very high flyers in the game. Uh, Uh, Professor Peter de Tum, uh, who is the um, editor of the Journal of Molecular and Cellular Cardiology. And he writes, work from the Suga lab led to the important development of pressure, volume, area, cardiac energetics. Where have you been for the last 10 years, uh, Professor de Tum? Immediately upon, immediately upon re reading his editorial, I sent him a, the paper, two papers by Han and Tran in 2012. They too sank like stones. We're not getting through, JC. Uh, much uh, at about the same time, or just a wee bit earlier, uh, Kutz Bushbeck, did you bring that volume? If not, could you please go and get it? That'd be great, thanks. I forgot. Uh, I take uh, responsibility for forgetting too. Um, and they have written, uh, Han et al. argued that Suga's potential energy, what we've labeled U for unknown, represents not only uh, work that be converted into mechanical energy, but also in part heat production, and that's its downfall. Uh, they've overlooked that. Unlike Suga, who determined oxygen consumption of whole hearts performing pressure volume work. Uh, Gibbs and colleagues measured heat production work performance of isolated papillary muscle. I love, the, I love this argument. You're wrong because you've used a different uh, preparation. Uh, Suga's got the real, the real thing, and if you don't do that, you've got it wrong. Thank you. Uh, this, uh, this, thanks, JC. Uh, this uh, mention is in uh, on page 483 in footnote 3 of this publication. Uh, this is one single publication. It runs to about 500 pages and I'm willing to wager, although I won't be around to collect, collect the wager, that none of you in this room will ever publish a paper of that size. <laughs> Not even you guys. Uh, I replied a week later saying, 
whereas you've interpreted the results of Han et al. to support Suga's theory, uh, Suga's theory uh, we think that if a theory provides an experimentally testable hypothesis, in this case, a value of work in efficiency that is independent of afterload, and if that hypothesis is re refuted, then so is the theory that spawned it. Bang, right between the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> now this is, to me, unimaginable. Three days later, I get this from Professor Kutz Bushbeck, who is the first author on that gigantic thing, asking our advice. Uh, do you think it's appropriate to supply Suga's oxygen consumption PVA relation when assessing the effects of cardiac assist devices in the energy requirements of the failing heart? Uh, I, can, I don't know the details, but I can see that they've just launched into this. They've killed the first few dogs or whatever they're going to do, and now somebody's telling them that it's all wrong. Uh, but they're very generous people and they're now asking our opinion. I've never been asked my opinion on anything <laughs> in my entire life. And I reply, our, our second paper of 2012, again, multiply authored but largely driven by Han and Tran, better equips us to respond to your question. Without appearing to be dogmatic, well, that's exactly how we're appearing, uh, we restate our reluctance to be to base future experiments on a theory, one of whose prediction, that is iso efficiency, has been experimentally refuted. We'll have to watch this space. Now we're going to leap backwards in terms of themes and go from the full Monty, that is thermodynamics, just back to mechanics. And this is good stuff. So wake up. The fundamental question, which has been around since 1895, when a, when a heart reaches the end of its shortening and is about to relax, it's reached the end systolic line. That's the end of systole and diastole is about to start. Same thing with an isolated uh, trabecula. So back in 1895, Otto Frank in Germany showed that there were two distinct end systolic pressure volume lines, one for isovolumetric contractions and one for uh, afterloaded contractions. It's a century old unresolved conundrum. And a review of the, all the literature for people who have decided to test this uh, once and for all, is it one or is it two? Starting with Frank and coming up to uh, much more recent times, well, you can see these few people here showed there's two relations and these showed one and two and so on. I maintain that in whether it's experimental science or theoretical science, uh, democracy plays no part whatsoever, and we have to go away and do the appropriate experiments, which is what these two youngsters did. Here's the now familiar passive force length relationship when uh, the heart is just being stretched out, stretched out to its optimal uh, volume and now undergoing a series of isometric contractions. This is in fact not whole heart but the uh, rat right ventricular papillary again. And, no, and over many years JC has observed this sort of behavior, that if you start at optimal length and you do various afterloaded contractions of the sort from which you can measure both heat and, and uh, stress, you will see that at the highest, at the highest uh, relative length now, uh, there's a good fit to the, after, to the afterloaded in systolic isometric relationship. But the more you, sh the, you reduce the afterload, the more the, the divergence from this dotted line and the isometric line is. If you now change, reduce the preload, that is you shorten the length, you see the same phenomenon repeat itself. A good fit 
under isometric conditions, a progressively poorer fish fit as you uh, reduce the afterload. And finally, if you go to a very short preload, in this case simulated by a short length, the same thing happens and you're doing all these contractions down here. JC plotted these three lines here and saw that they, or claimed that they produced a zone between the isometric and the uh, afterloaded end systolic pressure volume relationships or force length relationship. He further noted that if you now normalize not just for muscle length, but also for muscle stress, so now we're going from zero to one on both axes, uh, then these tend to superimpose on one another. And that allowed them to do something uh, very breathtaking. They proposed that the end systolic zone delineates the region in which all afterloaded contractions independent of preload will terminate. This is a very special zone. So uh, when JC is at his very best and singing and dancing in the lab, uh, we say to ourselves, JC is in the zone. <laughs> to test this proposition, uh, Han and Tran re-examined reported muscle length in publications <coughs> purporting to show that there is that there are results contrary to those of Frank. And that's the table I've just shown you where it's about half and half, whether it's one or two uh, um, end systolic zones, end, uh, end systolic pressure volume relations. And here's the, the, all told they tested about seven, eight or nine of these uh, from the literature, always with the same result. And here we have from the horse's mouths themselves, Suga and Sagawa, <coughs> in their cross-perfused blood circulated dog hole heart preparation. And you can see that they've increased the volume of the heart uh, artificially up to uh, 40 mils, and then under had the heart contract isovolumetrically or using afterloaded contraction. And bingo, they all fall on the same straight line. Exactly equivalent of Suga's straight line that we have shown in the ISO efficiency uh, paper. Um, G uh, Kenneth took over at uh, this point, I guess, and said, well, um, I wonder if, if, we, if these experiments have been done over a very wide range of preloads. And uh, he adjusted uh, the length. We don't know what the length is here. We know only the volume. Adjusted the length, uh, assuming a thin shell approximation of a spherical left ventricle using the Laplace law. Uh, and arrived at the conclusion that I think this volume is equivalent to a muscle length of about 0.9, 90% of optimal muscle force. Uh, the implication from this now, if, if Kenneth has got this right, is that the authors here were misled in panel A by reduction of a relative length from one, which they imagined, down to 90%. And now we see the familiar um, um, correspondence of both isometric and isotonic afterloaded points. That's a, a step in the right direction, but it's uh, not yet convincing because we, there's something that leaves, uh, that leaves uh, Paul Nielsen very uneasy about doing this. There's kind of no hook in here. Uh, you can be sure that you're doing things right. But here's not. And that was done in the whole heart, remember. We're now going to step, side, step down by about two orders of magnitude to cat papillary muscles, done by uh, some of the leading people at that time. And now they're going to vary both the, uh, the afterload here to the maximum that we can get 
and the preload, that is, we're going to do at these at different lengths. And while well, it's pretty obvious, they all lie on the same line. Uh, and it led the authors to say length tension curves obtained isotonically were virtually identical to those isometrically. Not so, says JC, whose eyes are a good deal better than mine. And he could see that every time there was a departure from this line of best fit, the departure was always in the same direction for any given pre-length or preload. And he says there are really three different uh, end systolic pressure volume or force length relationships in here. And now we're stepping down yet another couple of orders of magnitude to individual cells, individual myocytes. And this one to me is the real clincher. So these authors, uh, and it's a, it's a real mechanical tour de force uh, way back in 1993, they are getting single cardiac myocytes to contract either isometrically or isotonically, or either or both. <clears throat> and it's pretty clear that, well, this is not a straight line, but nor is it, a, uh, is it two separate lines, and they chose to believe that they were disagreeing with uh, Frank. But they very handily and very honestly said, we've measured the sarcomere length at what we're calling 100%, and it's only 2.14 micrometers. As a good many of you know, that's way off the maximum, which is taken to be 2.23 micrometers. Well, the ratio of 2.14 to 2.23 is 0.93, so let's replot this as being 0.93 relative muscle length here. And sure enough, we get the same thing. A couple of isometric contractions sit on the upper line completely, but there's a progressive departure as we shorten the muscle and get less force. So. Everybody that we've looked at has done an experiment over such a narrow range of lengths that they've been misled into thinking there's only a single end systolic pressure volume relation, one is, whereas in fact there's two. And uh, in the final, in the final uh, figure in their, in their <coughs> paper, uh, Han and Tran show this one. This goes, goes right back to um, Frank in 1895, and he's, he has these isolated hearts contracting either uh, an, an afterload contraction, as we've seen, and here's the work that is being done, uh, or isometrically, and this is the isometric curve, and there is a separation between the end systolic point on this curve and that, cor and that curve and this dotted line here can never penetrate this line because at this point the, the heart is relaxing. And it's going to relax in there, so it allowed them to paint in this one here saying, Frank, way back in 1895, got it wrong, and half the people who've uh, examined the question since have also got it wrong, and we've got it right. This lab, uh, just through the door here somewhere, at the Auckland Bioengineering Institute at the University of Auckland. 115 years later, uh, I dips me lid to you two youngsters. Time for an anecdote. Uh, about a year before they finished up this work, I peered over JC's shoulder one day, and what are you doing, JC? I'm uh, doing all this stuff here. And I said to him in a very stentorial tone. JC, this looks like more phenomenology to me. He ignored me totally, and uh, we and, uh, went our separate ways. Uh, so I apologize to you, JC. Um, <laughs> we, sub we submitted this paper where we knew it would be uh, accepted right away, the Journal of Cellular and Molecular Cardiology. Unbelievably, 
Professor Peter de Tome said, this would be of no interest to our readership. If you look carefully on here, you'll see his name across the back because he has given full support over a number of years for this work to be done and published in, the, in this journal. If anybody can unravel that thread, I'd uh, love to know what it is. Uh, it was really disappointing. I, I was invited to give a presentation on this work, of which I had nothing to do. But being the old silverback, I got the invitation, and the two youngsters stayed at home. Uh, and uh, I could see that um, that Professor de Tum was a, a designated speaker at the conference. Unfortunately, he had to, uh, and I was looking forward to a real uh, brouhaha, but unfortunately, he had to withdraw just before because he sits on uh, uh, a board that uh, administers grants to uh, NIH in, um, in the States, which tells you something about his status there. His status is a little lower with us at the moment. And now for a few moments of absolute, utter self-indulgence. I'm going to trot out half a dozen events that have given us great pleasure. Well, I guess everything done so far has given us pleasure, but these are not mentioned previously. These have not been mentioned previously. In 2014, we got a National Heart Foundation grant to study right ventricular energetics for the princely sum of $97,000. Uh, uh, Mari, your name is uh, highlighted here because uh, without your uh, motivation, motivating and guidance, uh, this would never have gone in because you were the uh, local expert on monocrotaline to uh, produce um, damage in the right ventricular uh, circulation. Uh, you ready for this one? That $97,000 grant spawned 19 peer-reviewed jour journal articles. Uh, if you can do the arithmetic, that's almost exactly $5,000 a, a, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> $5,000 an article, and that doesn't even normally even cover the, um, uh, cover the page charges. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what went on upstairs with the uh, accountants here, but it all came out in the end. So that was quite something. Uh, if we back up now a decade, uh, here's some work by uh, Kenneth Tran under the guidance of uh, Professor Edmund Crampen, who has uh, unfortunately left the ABI and has a, a professorship in, uh, in Melbourne. And once again, it goes right back to Chavot in 1896, who at the time asked what I considered to be a very a question with a very modern resonance. Does descending stairs backwards have the same energetic cost as ascending stairs forwards? Because you're using the same muscles, one to contract and the other to act as a brake. Uh, or in his, uh, and so he uh, got a bunch of volunteers. He put a Douglas bag on the back. He measured the oxygen consumption of the two. And he found that the oxygen consumption of Travaille the negative, negative work was very much less than that of travail positive, positive work. Translated into modern parlance, I thought might the entire crossbridge cycle be running in reverse here, regenerating ATP as you go down the stairs backwards. And I had a brief notion that I could recharge my battery every night before going home by taking the lift up and coming down the stairs walking backwards. <laughs> so uh, Kenneth developed a mathematical model to test this. And it was, as far as I can see, the very first model of, uh, of, the, of the cyclical activity of ATP and cross bridges with them attaching and being detached by the hydrolysis of ATP in a number of steps. It's the first one to have been thermodynamically constrained. And uh, the thermodynamic constraint comes, by, comes about by taking the ratio 
of the product of all the forward reactions over all the reverse reactions, and that has to equal to this uh, dependence on ATP, uh, the Gibbs free energy of ATP. We'd actually published this in an earlier paper, uh, and I've just copied this out because it's too much work to manufacture it all over again. This was published in Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology, um, where we had this howler. It's really embarrassing to go back to this paper and see that we printed this nonsense. Uh, now, if you were paying attention before, I've shown you that it's more or less the same thing. Uh, who wants to tell us why it's wrong? Uh, where have the universal gas constant, R, and T, the absolute temperature, gone? They fell out of here, so this is nonsense. Uh, but uh, once again, Kenneth ignored the, ignored the nonsense and did it properly. Uh, the net result of which was uh, there isn't a hope in hell of uh, creating energy in that way by going uh, backwards downstairs. This one I love because it's uh, on a special interest topic of mine which is uh, um, statistics, I guess, experimental design. And uh, Rohit Ramchandra, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, uh, and I took exception to, uh, to Professor Calhoun's insistence that a value of 0 0.5 was the only acceptable Bayesian prior pro probability that any experimental hypothesis is correct. He said, anything other than that, uh, you should have to go to jail. Because he says, that's when they bring me the criminal before you, and he's either, he's either guilty or he's innocent. And as far as you and the jury are concerned, that's got to be 50-50. Uh, we disagree, and bluntly stated, we just don't think that's the way science works. And if you want to know more about that, you can ask Rohit, who is not here tonight. Um, this one was good fun for a completely different reason. We studied this, uh, we, we produced this paper called Thermodynamic Analysis, uh, questions the scientific basis on which a diet of, that's rich in omega-3 fish oils is believed to reduce the risk of coronary heart disease, and how that has gained traction in the medical literature. And I would recommend that if you have any interest in uh, 40 years or more of utter bullshit, you should read this paper by Fodor, who uh, unfortunately pointed out that the people in Greenland who were being observed didn't even eat fish. They ate real blubbery mammalian creatures with big hanging jowls and whatnot, you know, and tusks and whatever they're called. Uh, it is a really sobering experience to read this and say, <coughs> how in the world did we get from this is what the guys did to, to the eating of fish, uh, which is good for us. Uh, and there's another one on the way now, uh, which I don't have time to talk about. So. Chris Barclay gets a mention here. <coughs> Some of you will have heard uh, my oral presentation on this at, um, at uh, PSNZ a year or two ago. And I mention this because Chris Barclay was my first PhD student. Uh, and um, after, coming, after getting his PhD in the Department of Physiology, he went to uh, the UK on a postdoctoral fellowship for a couple of years uh, and has been in Australia ever since. Uh, but like me, he has been granted uh, honorary membership in the, uh, uh, in the Bioengineering Institute and in uh, the Department of Physiology. So thank you, Laura, and thank you, Peter. And uh, this one was good because another 40-year mystery solved, this time by Ton. Where's Ton? Ton's over there in the corner hiding. Um, 
Does the intercept of the heat stress relation, if you remember way back when, one of the, the second slide, I think, I showed uh, uh, two uh, curvilinear lines, one in, AT, one in high calcium, one in low that JC had done. Uh, does it provide an, uh, an, inter a, um, an accurate estimate of cardiac activation heat? The answer to which was yes, despite there having been uh, 30 or 40 years and probably as many articles published saying we just cannot detect uh, a difference. Uh, just as had been the case with this one where Kenneth Tran did both experiments and mathematical modeling to show evidence that shortening heat does exist in cardiac muscle. In retrospect, after you finally solve this, you wonder how anybody ever could have imagined that it didn't, because the heart has to get smaller every time, and that is shortening heat, and there should have been heat associated with that, but no one had ever had the equipment in order to measure that or to detect it. And finally, it's only fit and proper that Andrew, together with Paul, get the final nod here, and 12 others of us on this paper. I think the title that Andrew came up with, A Dynamometer for Nature's Engines, is just as close to poetry as you can get. <laughs> and the, and the, and the uh, introduction uh, continues that poetry. Uh, once you get into the methodology, it gets a little tougher. <laughs> uh, but it's really good at the beginning. And uh, thank you for your generosity in having no fewer than 12 other people's names on there. If uh, it is this instrument which, at the risk of hubris, if not even temerity, allows me to state that throughout all our publications, I think that our group's investigations have strengthened the foundations of cardiac thermodynamics. I don't know if anybody has been convinced, but that's my opinion. And now I want to close by publicly thanking my wife of over five and a half decades. She will now disappear under the table, I know. Uh, whose crossing of the Tasman came at the expense of leaving behind her headship of the Department of English in a Melbourne school. She had the unfortunate experience to land here when there was a glut of teachers in general, a glut of English teachers in particular, and uh, at, during a time when um, New Zealand was undergoing one of its uh, common uh, self-flagellation uh, processes of saying, if you have been, if you got trained in the country and you have worked outside the country, you don't deserve to have a job back inside the country. That's, uh, I knew you'd like that kind of thing, Dane. Uh, it's uh, not uh, all that rare, that sort of thinking. Uh, not only did she accompany me to my retirement dinner, generously and thoughtfully uh, organized by Peter, but she also accompanied the hospital on trolley on which I was hauled out of the restaurant horizontally to the complete <laughs> indifference of the other patrons <laughs> and at the cost of ruining the uh, uh, dessert for the guests. You, know, um, you can't ask for more loyalty in a wife than that now, can you? Uh, and uh, finally, thank you for attending and thank you for listening. Unfortunately, there's no time for questions. <laughs> this is a gift for your um, public seminar. For your public seminar. <laughs> and the title is The Clock of Life. Wonderful. Thank you. Any question? <laughs> Thank you very much. I've got a few words to say, because physiology can't not say things. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm the head of the department of physiology. My principal job in life is to make sure that we're a functioning toaster in the tea room. <laughs> so they can make his morning toast at 6.30 in the morning. Um, Dennis has always said he didn't want a big dinner, 
for a big fancy thing and no long speeches and all the rest of it. Now I know why. <laughs> uh, so we're not going to have, there's a few things at the back, treat, you know, no dessert, or maybe there is dessert for you this time. And uh, the short speech will be short because I don't do big fancy speeches. <clears throat> but the gathered crowd here do feel that it is necessary to say thank you. And it is thank you to the huge intellectual effort that you've put into teaching us all, um, our students and our fellows, uh, through the cardiac physiology, the respiratory physiology, and if I'm going to channel the laws of thermodynamics, heat is work and work is heat. And his work into statistics teaching has certainly heated up many of the students. Physiological competition. Sheer explosion. I want to thank you personally um, for the Department of Physiology for the energy and the energy that you bring to every domain in physiology. Everything that we do is supported by your 110%. Your generosity of spirit and helping people is evident by the work that we've just seen and the success of our department and the happiness of our department, toast notwithstanding. <laughs> and finally, um, from me personally, and I, I guess many others here, I would like to thank you for your magnificent sense of humour. Uh, you are just this amazing person who comes out with these quips, and I love your arguments with all of these editors. I think you should now spend your time just there's clearly a lot to be done still in that domain and you're the person to do it. So we do thank you from the bottom of our heart. That is going to be it. You do not need to do a return reply, but two things. I'm always criticised, I say, oh, there's a chocolate prize, chocolate fish prize for uh, things. And I did say in the department that everyone had to come because the title of this talk was so good that you have to have the classic chocolate fish prize. So, and then someone said, you never pony up to this. Anyway. <laughs> you don't have to <coughs> anything, but you do have to open this. So everyone can see. Uh, Laura, I'm already on the point of blubbing. No, that's OK. Uh. Um, I brought scissors. Because <laughs> I saw how this woman wrapped this up, and I think she's in Cheney bondage. So uh, we collectively would like to say thanks. Yeah. And not a big card either, because he's already had that at the hospital. Um, but if you do want to sign it, you need an insert. I've made one, so it's all <laughs> No, I think you'd better do it. No, no. I'm going to take that off. This, this is a piece of work from a very fantastic artist called Graham Hitchcock. And when I looked, when I saw this, I thought, this is Dennis. This is Dennis, who has taught us not to look down and just be so reductionist and not to fall into the traps that you've seen presented here, but to look out and to look up. Scissors? <laughs> you said it was going to be a very short speech. Yeah, that is short for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very nearly there. I don't want to lose this beautiful gold braid here. No, you can do it that way. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? No answers. <laughs> when I stood, when I stood up at the end of the previous uh, seminar, uh, which absolutely was the most amazing seminar I've ever heard in my life, I pointed out that I was a lucky man because I. A very unlucky man, because I had to follow that woman speaking. Um, but obviously not, because she didn't get a nice big parcel like this. <laughs> okay, this is a really good point to now say it's made of glass. <laughs> <laughs> now, just, be just before I take the next and final step, oh, no, I need to way. know, is this, is this given to me or to us, <laughs> wife and I? Well, it's given to her and you can look at it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll look at it when she allows and I, I you'll was, think of us fondly, I hope. I was offered a, um, a dinner uh, at Physiology, but I turned it down when I heard the alternative was $250 worth of books. My wife and I went to the bookstore. <laughs> And I think I was allocated about $50. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, is this? <laughs> okay, what the hell's the trick? <laughs> <laughs> You're making me look like a, I'm you look an, like a inco principal. incompetent. <laughs> Practical skills. Mari, come up and dissect it for us. <laughs> it's the next level. She did go really go into making sure this wasn't going to break. <laughs> it's, it's without end, I can see. It's precious, like you are, baby. Alright, you think you can manage? Not just quite yet. All right, here you go. <laughs> Delicately, do you want? Shall I mop your <laughs> I know, but then I just thought. Oh. No, nope, don't take them away yet. <laughs> this is really sticky stuff here. Yeah, it's called solitaire. Who did you say wrapped this? Very nice lady. <laughs> very nice lady. <laughs> Who wanted to make sure. I know sure. quite a few very nice ladies. Do you not think that's like Dennis? <laughs> Dennis, you want to look at it as well? <laughs> Always looking up and out, right? <laughs> Don't cry! <laughs> <laughs> it's my favourite glass artist and I decided that if you didn't like it, I could just cry. <laughs> One of the things I've noticed about... Okay, okay, if I just have a little... Speak now, <laughs> tiny one. Uh, about uh, growing old is that you get progressively maudlin, and I uh, don't want to display that in public, so I'm going to grit my teeth and say thank you, Laura. You're welcome. Who's going to turn now? And thank you, Peter, when you when you decided to allow me to hitch my horse to your wagon when it had been unhitched up the hill, as you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. An absolute <laughs> okay, now there's, a, I understand JC has some, a few nibbles on the back somewhere, peanuts or something, and there, <laughs> there, there, there. There isn't nearly enough to feed everybody, so about half of you are going to have to go home empty. <laughs> Thank you.